On this video, I'm going to finally open and use my Himi Mia gouache that I waited to get for many years until it finally came on sale for a reasonable price. This is the 24 set that comes with brushes and a white mixing palette. I have prepared two dollar store palettes so I can take out some of the gouache once I open each cup in order to use it in the palette, which it will be okay if it dries out because I'm going to spray it with demineralized water. This is the white mixing tray and the lovely brushes which we'll be testing out as well in this video. I'm going to cut away here where I clean off the brushes as well. Now I'm going to open each container, but I'm not going to put them in the order they come in on this box. And I don't want to get confused about which color is which. So I take some small stickers and look at the bottom of the container in order to write out the exact color names. Here I'm skipping along in the process rather than showing you every one. And I put these stickers on the sides of each jelly cup to label correctly which colors they are. They're labeled on the bottom, annoyingly so, but I'm able to organize them. I then change the color order because it's completely ridiculous and nonsensical which order the cups come in initially. I'm going to use a palette knife not only to mix up the jelly with a spritz of demineralized water, which is highly recommended you do. The other tip I received when figuring out how to do this by watching several videos is to heat up the edges of the jelly gouache to heat it up by holding it next to something warm if the glue is having trouble opening. It takes a little while to mix them. I had actually sped up this footage and edited it quite a lot, but I found it made it perfectly smooth and an absolute dream to work with. My first impressions of using jelly gouache are, it might be my favorite paint I've ever used. I truly love this medium, and once I was finally able to get it for a decent price, the price is most excellent. The only issue is probably risk about toxic chemicals, because it's unknown what was used to make the paints, and also unknown light fastness. But as I intend to use them for sketches and work I'm going to scan and print, and not sell the original work created by them, I think it's fine. I'm also going to do light fastness tests with some of the swatches I made here, although I still have forgotten to put them up in the window, I need to do that. I'm making swatches in a white sketchbook, a tan sketchbook, and also on the side I'm doing swatches on two different watercolor papers. I do swatches on a smooth hot press and a more textured cold press paper. I found I really liked how it looked on all the different papers, but it did work very differently. And the one that I thought looked the best overall was actually the cold press paper, although normally that's not my favorite. I have been painting on lots of different paper with the jelly gouache lately, and I'll do a more in-depth review and a bunch of future videos using my jelly gouache that I finally got a hold of. The ones that have a special marker on them on the jelly cup NL means non-light fast based on other people's observations of these colors, whereas some of the other colors were actually rated a little more light fast, but I still need to do my own tests because there's no official light fastness information. You tend not to be able to trust companies with this stuff anyway, so it's better to do independent tests and to check with other artists as well. Most of the jelly cups were not particularly hard to open, and for a couple that were stuck, I did hold them up near my filming light in order to make them warmer, which made the glue come off much easier, so that tip totally does work. I also recommend being patient with this process and trying to enjoy it, because it does take quite a while to do these initial swatches, putting it in your other palette, and opening each cup up and mixing them. Also make sure to use demineralized or deionized water, water that doesn't have impurities in it, so that you're not encouraging the growth of mold or mildew in the gouache. My plan is also to close the original palette and only open it again when I intend to get fresh gouache for different painting purposes or to refill my palettes so that I've stuck some of these paints in. As I'm trying to preserve every last little speck of paint, I'm scraping off paint from the lids to put back into it. With that, I scrape off onto the palette, and then, in order to make the swatches, I take some of the paint from the metal palette knife. I also saved all of the tops from the gouaches that I scraped the paint off of because there's still some traces of paint on them, and I intend to use that paint in paintings. This is part of the whole, trying to use absolutely every bit of the paint I possibly can, while still trying to balance it out and not over-stressing about every speck. There's quite a bit of paint in here. As I've already decided I absolutely love the jelly gouache, my plan is probably to try to get the 56 set for Christmas, which will have a replacement for every color in this 24 set and a bunch of other already mixed or new colors in the set. 
I also found that I truly enjoyed the brushes that came with this set. They were extremely good, they work for the way I like to paint, and they work exceptionally well with gouache. For the grass green and the previous green there, which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head, I think I put them in slightly the wrong order for the way I want my rainbow order to go, because this one's more yellowish and the previous one was actually more bluish, so I should have swapped them. However, I didn't realize that when I was making the color order, so it's kind of too late, and I decided just to leave it because, you know, it's good enough. This turquoise here is called Jade Green, which is very strange to me because it's a dark turquoise green, which is more of the shadows in a forest color. And this bright glowing phthalo, which is gorgeous, is called Acid Blue. So some of the names are interesting or different than I'd expect, but they still make sense. They're just different than the standard naming conventions. This sky blue is a very nice sky blue color. I also intend to work on some landscapes and lots of different artwork with these paints in the future. A couple of them were a little rougher or bumpier in a way, and a couple of them were slightly drier than the other ones as well. In such a case, I added a little bit extra water and mixed it up for longer. A couple of the darker colors were like this, except I found the black was the most liquid of all, and I basically didn't even need to spray anything. Now this one here, the Prussian blue, was messed up and I actually had to stop filming opening it because it was actually exploding out the sides a bit. I carefully stopped holding it over the palette and I moved for the rest of these openings to not opening them directly over the palette just in case. It exploded slightly over the sides onto my fingers but not onto anything below, thank goodness. And I used the heating it up method with the lamp and very carefully peeled it off but that one was the one that was a little explodey and particularly messy, though I didn't have that trouble with any of the other ones. It is a risk, so be aware of that when you get your set and you're opening them. More to go. As you'll notice, the black one coming up after this is already so liquidy and ready to go, I basically didn't even need to mix it nor spray any water in it. I decided to separate out the swatches into the last part, and I put the other two watercolor papers on the opposite page of the sketchbooks. This made it much easier for me because I was filming. I also recommend if you like using black gouache the way I do to fill in solid areas in the background of things sometimes, take out a bit extra of the black in your palettes if you're using the separate palette technique, which I did. I also took out extra white. White is an extremely useful color. The biggest flaw I see with this 24 set is the fact that it only has one white, whereas the 18 set has two. However, I really like this set. If possible, I'd like to get the 100 milliliter refill of the white, but I don't think that's actually available in Canada. Although I know they do exist, I don't think I can get it in my country, and if I can, it's not going to be a reasonable price. I might keep looking though, on the off chance I'm able to find it. The recording process isn't perfect for these swatches, but I still really like it. As you can see, the colors actually look slightly different on different papers, but the texture of the paper affected the way I used the colors more than you'd think. On some papers, it dried faster and was a little harder to blend out if I didn't work extremely quickly, and even if I did, whereas on some papers, it was able to dry a little bit slower or move a bit more. I found that the textured watercolor paper, the cold press, was the absolute easiest to work with and blend out the best even after it's been sitting on the paper for a minute, whereas my cheapest sketchbook paper, the cheap little dollar store sketchbook, was the worst for blending it out. However, I found it actually quite difficult to work with in a similar way on my hot press Fabriano watercolor paper, which weirdly had less control, more back runs, and a lot harder to blend things out. They dry extremely fast and then be hard to move. However, it is gouache and is easy to move. You can also blend things out fairly easily if you use a more clean brush and scrub gently, or if you use a slightly watered down version of the color. There's a lot of practice involved because you can accidentally lift if you're not careful with layering in gouache. If you use thicker gouache on thinner gouache, you should have less trouble versus if you're trying to use thin washes on top of thick. In general, you can work directly thick if you'd like, even though some people recommend starting only with a thin layer, letting it fully dry and working on top. You do not have to work this way, especially with jelly gouache. I work only with thick paints for this painting, for example. 
At no point do I use extremely watered down or tea quality paint. I'm using only thick paint. I also did use some slightly thinned down paint on top of very thick paint. I had to be extremely gentle and delicate when I did this. You had to be very careful, but it is possible to do so to get certain effects. You can also use that sort of technique very gently in order to create a gradient by blending colors together. I recommend you practice. Things work differently on different paper. This is very thin craft sketchbook paper, and yet I love this paper. I find a lot of mediums actually work exceptionally well on it. You'd be surprised how well watercolor works, and gouache can be a dream. The swatches might not have looked as perfect on this paper, but Working thickly on this paper, it's actually really, really good for gouache. The smoothness of the paper and the fact that everything really does stay more on the surface of the paper when you're working with thick gouache make it actually extremely nice to work with. I found this before for other types of gouache, but I found the jelly gouache to be even more perfect to work with on this paper. I got this sketchbook at Dollarama a while ago, and even though I found a replacement in 2018, I've been looking since then and haven't found one, so you'd have to get really lucky to find one, but if you can, I say you should snap it up. I'm going to continue experimenting on many different papers and surfaces, and I advise you do too. Gouache can be used on many different types of papers. Don't restrict yourself to only traditional white watercolor paper. Use different toned and colored paper as a base. The unifying properties of a color underneath can be exceptional, as well as giving yourself the ability to really learn about how opaque the different colors are and how to mix the colors more opaquely. By working on tan paper, I understand how to mix white into things to make them more opaque and how to layer in such a way as to get the colors to look even better. I've also been working with watercolor and watercolor and gouache mixed together on tanned paper of various sorts, and I find it extremely helpful for not only the unifying color undertone properties, but also to learn more about the way the colors work, such as opacity and layering. It also is an interesting option when you're tired of always painting on white paper. You don't have to paint on white paper all the time if you have access to other colored paper. Another tip you can do is use watercolor or very watered down gouache to create a base layer color or tone on the white paper you're going to work on so that after it's fully dry, it's not a white surface anymore, but whatever color you wanted it to be. This is a very good way of filling in the gaps in the paper so you don't have to worry about tiny unwanted white gaps between your paint or things that make the colors stand out in the wrong area because this area has thinner paint so the white of the paper shines through too much whereas another area has thicker paint and it looks a slightly different tone. This is a problem that actually can happen more often on white paper that I don't see a lot of people addressing, but it's an issue with gouache and watercolor that can be avoided by toning the surface first or by using a toned surface initially. After a break to go do something else, I came back to the painting once the initial part was dry. Now I'm working with slightly more watered down paint in this area, but barely watered down at all. It's really still quite thick. I'm working quickly and switching between colors a lot. This is perfectly fine method. Don't feel that you have to work in a way where the brush is always completely clean or where it isn't. Now, if you're trying not to contaminate the initial well of the color, I advise you thoroughly rinse your brush off or use a separate brush to pick the color up and put in the palette so you can then mix it. You can use multiple brushes, including using brushes specifically to pick up colors to mix. This is a good technique. Using a damp, clean brush specifically for blending, you can make it vaguely moist for blending things out. I also used a cleaned off brush here to lift some of the excess gray I'd accidentally put on the face. This was an example of using a more watered down color on top of a thick layer, but I had to be very gentle so it wouldn't completely disrupt and lift the white back off the page. By letting that white of the face I painted earlier completely dry, it's a little harder for it to lift up, but keep in mind that these paints are not acrylic based. They are very liftable and very destroyed by water. So try not to drop any water on the pages once you've completed your work and don't wipe up any water you do drop. If a water droplet falls on the page, leave it alone to air dry. Let it thoroughly dry and make any corrections at that point. If you dab up an area where water falls, you will lift up the paint underneath. You can use this 
technique intentionally to erase mistakes created by jelly gouache. You can also use this technique to lift highlights back into things if you want to show the color underneath of the page. So it's especially useful on white paper. I advise you do practices. Get studies you're allowed to paint. I used a public domain image as the reference for this macaw. And take your time. Try to relax and be happy with what you're doing. Do research, but don't overthink it. I find as long as I'm happy and relaxed, I can do a much better job much faster. If I stress out too much and get too anxious, sometimes I can't even create art. My mental state and well-being extremely affects me as an artist and my ability to create work. So I think taking care of your mental health, being relaxed and happy about the art supplies you're using and what you're doing makes an enormous difference. I don't think people are even talking about it enough because it makes more of a difference to me than the medium and the paper or anything else. So be kind to yourself. This material I prepared for and got excited for for years. And I already liked normal gouache. I was very excited to use it. I don't think I'm biased from all that research. I really enjoy regular gouache, but it's more expensive. So I feel it's harder for me to use up the supplies I invested in if they're too pricey. That is the greatest advantage of the cheaper, less expensive jelly gouache. This final painting in this video will depict the gouache used on black paper. This is a black paper test, but it's also another bird. But this bird is actually one I invented, a species of bee eater that I made up. After doing a lot of research and gathering reference about a lot of different real world bee eaters and related creatures to bee eaters, like the Mot Mots, I invented several birds for my main world of Vatar and intend to invent more that could realistically be a member of real bird families present on Earth. I intend to invent even more realistic animals based on living and extinct creatures on Earth that could exist on another world but could fool someone into thinking they really exist on Earth. This is always fun for me to do. This is the turquoise forest bee eater, a species I made up for my main world of Alpha Vatar. Just a small, bee-eating, acrobatic, beautiful bird that lives in forests and jungles. I'm still choosing exactly where on my main world it is and if it's going to be present on other planets or not. But in the meantime, I have my initial Copic art illustration that I used as reference before repainting it here. I looked at a reference photo of a real living bee eater of a similar looking species to my invented one in the pose that I used for the final gouache artwork. Then I simply combined the two references in order to get my invented bee eater into this pose. I also changed the reference up. I changed a little bit about how the branch looked from the reference photo of the bee eater in the position I was using by adding different spiky bits to it and the exact color and texture of it was more from my imagination than from the actual reference. This entire process has obviously been sped up. It's not the speed I'm working at. To create the gradient on the face, I've mixed a little bit of the yellow earth color in with white and I mixed a little bit more and then a little bit more. I worked very quickly going up towards the beak. In my initial color, it has that sort of gradient. I looked at a lot of real species of bee eaters and I studied a little bit of nature documentaries and learned about them. With the knowledge of how the real animal works, its biology, and a lot of reference of real ones for inspiration, I was able to invent a convincing invented species. If you use real world inspiration for your animals, you can go more realistic. This is very much on the it could be a real species side of things, all the way up to crazy alien magical elemental creatures. But by using imaginative realism, real world biology and help by knowing animals, you can get better results than if you don't know what you're talking about. If you understand why animals are the way they are, you can depict animals better. If you care about them, you can make them look alive. If you actually like them, you can put that love into the paintings you make. If you want to get better at painting birds or making fantasy birds, study real birds. Care about real birds. Look at not just still images, but also look at them in motion. Look at video footage and think about 
what you're designing, not just from an aesthetic side point, but also from how the real birds work, how the real birds look. Make sure what you're creating is plausible if you want it to look plausible. If you want it to look crazy, make it look crazy. But keep that real information and that real love for real nature in there and you'll have much better results with your fantasy creatures and fantasy animals. I should also say to study the skeleton and musculature of animals in order to understand them even deeper. Sometimes the geometric shapes and how they move in motion is more important than the skeleton, and other times understanding the skeleton and musculature can really help. So I advise you do lots of study and research while enjoying yourself, and that'll really help. Here I carefully put things in after mixing the colors carefully in the white palette. I noticed a great feature of jelly gouache is there's less drying shift between the color when it's wet and dry than a lot of other gouaches, which makes it easier, more fun, and more enjoyable to work with. But there can be a slight drying shift in some cases. Once again, that's all for this video. If you like my videos, please remember to like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell to all notifications so you will know when a new video comes up. I aim for new videos every Wednesday, but sometimes life happens and things are delayed. I hope that you enjoyed this video and we'll see you with another one very soon.